because the mirror of God's word, truth changes everything. And if we'll open up our heart and say, God, are there times that I ever look like a Pharisee? Do I ever act like I'm better than other people? Do, do I ever put anything or anybody above you? Do I ever do that? Here's the thing, the truth, God's word is with us every single day. We all have the opportunity to learn and to grow. And in this day and hour, you all, there is nothing more important than our relationship with Christ. And so my question to you and to me is, what is the truth? What is Jesus Christ doing in our lives? And how are we responding? Today on Bridges, we're going to talk about and take a look at a story in the Bible about what happens when people encounter the truth. I'm Monica Schmelter, and I'm glad that you could join us for Bridges today. And today, I titled this message, Truth Changes Everything. God promises that His Word never goes forth and returns void, but that His Word always accomplishes its intended purpose. And so this story that we look at today is probably one that you've heard before, but I want us to look at how the truth, and Jesus, of course, is the truth. He says in John 14, 6, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him. So when, when I talk about truth, I'm talking about Jesus Christ. And we're going to look in the story at Luke 7. We're going to start in the 36th verse, and we're going to look at the story of the woman with the alabaster box. And I'll read from the New Living Translation, and it starts there. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him, meaning Jesus, saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other, but neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said, Simon. You need to take careful note of that part. Then he turned to the woman, Jesus looking at the woman, and he says, Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You, meaning Simon, didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the first time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You, again, speaking to Simon while looking at the woman, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. But she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. So she has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. 
the men around the table said amongst themselves, who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And this story of the woman with the alabaster box, I'm reading from Luke 7, and I read verses 36 to 50 out of the New Living Translation. And what I want us to do in this story is to look at what happens with each person in the story as, the, as they encounter the truth of Jesus Christ. So the characters that are introduced to us in this story are first, the woman with the alabaster box. She is not named. We don't know her first name. Some theologians say that this is on purpose, that this was done out of kindness because uh, she's referred to as an immoral woman and with a woman of the past so that it was out of kindness that her name is not mentioned. I don't know if that is it or if that's not. We just know her as the woman with the alabaster box. We know that there are a group of people. We know that there are a group of Pharisees that are present. We know that the Pharisee that did the inviting and the Pharisee to whom Jesus spoke in this story is Simon. And we know that Jesus is present. And so as we go into this story about truth changes everything, I want us to look at how each character in the story, how they respond to the truth of Jesus Christ and how that truth changes everything. I also want to let you know that we will have online extras up on the website with today's scripture and a place for you to take notes if you would like to do that. Remember again when we started out that I said that God's word declares that when it goes forth, that it never returns void, but that it always accomplishes his intended purpose. And so many times when we look at our lives and when we look at scripture, we think, well, you know, I don't think that like anything's happening. But as we look at each of these people, we're going to see how the truth of Jesus Christ did change every single person in that room. So I want us to look at what went on in this story and what this scripture teaches us. So we know that this woman with the alabaster box shows up because she heard Jesus was going to be eating there. We know clearly that she has a reputation as an immoral woman. We know Simon's the one that is issued this invitation. And so, you know, we see that <clears throat> this woman just is lavishing Jesus with worship and that with her tears, she cleanses his feet and she wipes the, the tears with her hair. And if you think about what kind of a position of worship that that was, and that this woman, she had to feel the scorn of the Pharisees and of Simon in this room. I mean, you know, and I know, have you ever walked into a room where people have just had an argument, but everything's quiet when you walk in? but you can feel that something's wrong. And you say, you know, is everything okay? And people are like, oh yeah, everything's okay. But then you find out later an argument happened. Well, the reason that we can feel that is because communication is a spirit. And so what we're feeling when we walk in the room is that spirit, that angst that happened. This woman has to feel that. And yet she doesn't care. She goes right ahead and she worships. <laughs> And she wipes Jesus' feet. She cleans them with her tears. I mean, this is an extravagant act of worship, really, for a woman who is probably an uninvited guest. She just heard Jesus would be there. And she begins this act of worship. And Simon, now Simon, it's his house, and he's the one that's vocal. But probably everybody in the room is thinking, if he was a prophet... He would know who she is. And look, he can't possibly be a prophet. He can't pro possibly be a savior because he's letting that sinful woman touch him. Now, let's stop there for just a moment because it can be so easy to look at these stories in the Bible, which is, I believe these stories happened. I believe that God's word is true. And we can look at the Pharisees and be critical of their attitudes 
Uh, we clearly know that their attitudes are not biblical. They're not filled with the life that we find in Jesus Christ. But aren't there times, if we're honest, that we've thought, I wonder why God did that. Like, I don't think that's, I don't think that that could be God. I mean, that doesn't seem like it could be, you know, I, no, I don't know. I don't know. And for them, this picture that they're being presented with doesn't line up with what they think a prophet would be like or what they think that Jesus, redeemer of all mankind would be like. He is not fitting with what they think. And what we need to understand when I say truth changes everything is that Jesus is the truth. His word is the truth. And it always elicits a response from us every time we hear it. And sometimes we have to muddle through the beginning stages of when we dig into a passage or a scripture and it doesn't seem right or it seems disruptive. We have to understand that whatever God says is truth. And if we don't understand it, further investigation, further study is required. But so Simon is thinking, well, I mean, if he's really who he says he is, like he would not be letting her do that. And Jesus didn't let that go. It's very interesting to me. Jesus starts with a story and he says, hey, you know, Simon, if, if you loaned this amount of money to this person and that's, you know, 500 pieces of silver, but you give this person 50 pieces of silver, who do you think um, would love him more? And he says, well, the one who's been forgiven more. Uh, the one who he canceled the larger debt, Simon answers. And Jesus says, that's right. But then when Jesus goes to say something to Simon, when he says, Simon, I have something to say to you, he does not look at Simon. He looks at the woman. So I want you to imagine with me like what the feeling would be in the room. Have you ever had someone talk to you, but they will not look at you? Like how awkward that is? Because your thoughts are, what, are you talking to me? Because you're looking over there. And he's like, I have something to say to you, you know, when I entered your home. He says, you didn't uh, offer me water to wash the dust from my feet. He says, but she washed my feet with her tears and she wiped them with her hair. Now for Simon, this is his home. He's a Pharisee. He walks in a leadership and in a powerful position. And now Jesus is not facing Simon. He's looking toward this woman and he is calling Simon out. Because the custom of this day, which this is not what we do today, when people come to our home, I mean, I don't offer to wash the dust off of anybody's feet. I mean, do you? No, we don't do that. He says, but you know, she's washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. So Jesus is calling Simon out in front of Simon's peers and in front of this woman that they think is of ill repute and scorn. And I say they think because the woman is forgiven. So she's no longer a woman of ill repute. Her, our past, when we come to faith in Christ, our past, our sins are utterly obliter obliterated by the blood of Jesus Christ. The word says what's red as scarlet is white as snow. And you know and I know that there are people who would prefer or who just seem to lavish in knowing us according to our sins. Oh, you know how you used to be blah, blah. <clears throat> You know, here's the thing. Jesus forgave me for how I used to be. And if you know Christ, he's forgiven you for how you used to be. So th the past has been obliterated. So Jesus goes on. He's like, you didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the first time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. He continues to call Simon out. He says, you neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. But she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. And I can't imagine how frustrated they all are when he gets to the next part, when he says, yeah, I tell you, her sins, there are many. Yep, they are. But she's shown me much love. But a person who's forgiven a little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. So at this point, the Pharisees and Simon are like really mad because I mean, like who, do you, who does he think he is to forgive sins? 
I mean, seriously, like we invited you over here, Jesus, so that we could ask you some questions and whatever. And then this woman shows up and look at the way that this is going. So now you think that you can forgive sins. And Jesus says to the woman, your faith has saved you. So go in peace. So you think about the woman who offers this incredible act of worship in the midst of such turmoil, in the midst of such judgment. And you know, the Bible says that it is in essence a mirror and that when we look into the Bible, it is a mirror and that it shows us a reflection of who we really are. Sometimes we look into these stories and we talk about truth changes everything and we think of the woman with the alabaster box like that's her. But if we're holding up the mirror, what about ourselves might we see about ourselves in her? What is the attitude of our heart toward God? Because the Bible is a mirror. And as I read this story, what does it tell me that I'm like? And I want us to consider for just a couple of moments, some things about the, this woman. Not only the cost of the rare perfume, but this lavish, extravagant act of worship in the presence of people who did not think she was worthy. She had to feel that. She had to feel like an outsider, but she loved Jesus enough that she didn't care. And for any of us who has been through a church hurt or a rejection. Her story holds up a mirror to us. Do I love Jesus enough to continue to worship him even though I've been hurt by his people? And I will say this about church hurt. And again, there's not one part of my heart that ever wants to make a person feel like, well, what you experienced wasn't real, it wasn't painful. That's not what I'm saying at all. It is our love and our commitment for him greater than what happened. So many people walk away from Christ, they walk away from church, they walk away from the community of faith because they've been hurt. I most assuredly would not tell you to go back into a place that's hurt you or that's abused you. What I am saying is find a place of community of faith. What I'm saying is don't let it stop you in your tracks. Truth changes everything. This woman with the alabaster box, while she teaches us many lessons, she teaches us that we can give our Savior extravagant worship in the worst of circumstances and in the midst of judgment, her story still rings loud, clear, and true to us today. Don't let anybody stop you from worshiping Christ. Don't let somebody who talks to you about your past or who thinks that you're not good enough, do not let their words have more power than the truth because remember, the truth is in this room, Jesus Christ. He's in the room with Simon, the Pharisees, and the woman with the alabaster box. He's in the Bible that we open up every single day. He is the truth, and he is also present. And his truth and who he is is stronger than other people's opinions over us. Now let's take a moment. Let's keep holding the mirror of God's word up. And instead of looking at these people as these people and we're over here and Simon, you're just so lousy for your judgment and you're just so this or that. If we hold the mirror of God's word up, do we not ever see the heart of Simon or one of the Pharisees in us? Are there not times that we're ever judgmental or legalistic or we miss it or we swallow a, a, a camel by straining a gnat. Is there not a time that that doesn't ever come up? Because the mirror of God's word, truth changes everything. And if we'll open up our heart and say, God, are there times that I ever look like a Pharisee? Do I ever act like I'm better than other people? Do, do I ever put anything or anybody above you? Do I ever do that? And I want to, because Simon really gets called out. And here's the thing. 
all the things that Jesus is saying to Simon, well, you know, you didn't anoint my head, you didn't wash my feet. If Simon would have ever said, I'm sorry, Lord, I should have done those things. He would have been forgiven and restored. Jesus calling him out was an opportunity for Simon to come to Christ. Whenever we get called out by the word when we're at church, when we get called out, the idea is not to crush us. The idea is to bring us back to Christ. And I wanna share with you something that happened for me uh, just a couple of days ago while watching the live stream at my church. My pastor was talking about um, the urgency that we all need to have to put Christ first, the times that we live in. He talked about a praise event that we're going to have in just a month or so, and probably about 7,500 people will show up to that in the town square and will worship. He said, but you know, when we have a prayer night, we're, we're really lucky if we get 700 people. And his point was, what are you people busy doing? And where is your urgency? Prayer is an important part of our relationship with God. You know, and so I'm listening to that and I'm thinking, well, you know, I am a person of prayer and I do like the praise and worship. So, you know, that's really good. And I am, you know, I do have a sense of urgency about wanting people to Christ. You know, my intention, my prayerful intention this year is to share the gospel with more people than I ever have before. And I don't mean that just on TV, though that counts. Just in everything that I'm doing, I'm looking for ways to share Christ. And um, so then he started talking about communion. Now at our church, we do communion a little differently than most. This is not to say the way that your church does communion is wrong. It's just the way that we do it at our church. After the service, there are communion stations positioned around where you can go get the bread and the cup. You can go back to a seat and you can pray and you can read the scripture and you can take the bread and the cup. And so what many people do at the end of service is that rather than go take communion, they just leave and go eat dinner or do whatever they're going to go do. And so our pastor was talking about, so what is it that you have that's so important that you go do that like you can't stay and take communion? He's like, communion is biblical. It says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. And I, I, I saw myself in that and I thought, you know, I don't take communion all the time. There are many times I leave. And in my head, up until he said that, my thought was, well, you know, I'm leaving because I've invited people to church with me. And um, I, I invite people to church. Anybody that will come, I invite them and I sit with them. And some of them don't know the Lord. Others would be considered backslidden. Others would be considered on the fringe of the church. But my heart is that they would come to the Lord. And so I'm so excited when they come to church with me. And so... Instead of doing communion, I leave with them because they don't want to do communion. And so this word isn't for everybody. God wasn't speaking this to everybody. But in that moment, I felt like God called me out and that I need to make my Savior a priority and take communion and just tell my friends, if you want to go wait in the car, if you want to wait in the lobby, if you want to take communion, whatever you want to do, like, I'm not Planet Fitness, this isn't a judgment zone, but I, I need to take communion, I need to honor the Lord, I need to remember what He's done for me. So, truth changes everything. When I heard that, I knew that that was the Holy Spirit saying to me that I needed to step up in that area of my life. Whatever my reasons were, whatever I thought they were, I was really putting the people that I was inviting to church above my Savior, and I can't do that. So I just told them, you know, you can do whatever you need to do, wait in the car, wait in the lobby, go ahead for where we're going to have dinner, do whatever you need to do. I'm going to take communion. I'm going to remember what God has done for me. He's done far too much for me to bolt out of service and not honor him with communion. And so what I'm saying as I say truth changes everything is these people in the story, they are all of us. We are all like some of them at some point in our life. The story of the woman with the alabaster box is not just a story that we look at and like she's over there. We have parts of her in our story. And Simon is not just, ooh, that awful Pharisee. 
He is someone that Jesus loved and was trying to invite into relationship with him, but Simon would not change his heart. The truth for him made his heart harder. So when the Bible says that his word always goes forth, it never returns void, but always accomplishes his intended purpose. The truth brings out what is inside of us. And then we get that beautiful opportunity to repent, to grow, to change or not. Or maybe at a further time, that seed will come to fruition. Here's the thing, the truth, God's word is with us every single day. We all have the opportunity to learn and to grow. And in this day and hour, you all, there is nothing more important than our relationship with Christ. And so my question to you and to me is, what is the truth? What is Jesus Christ doing in our lives? And how are we responding? Like, are we really on fire for him? Like the woman with the alabaster box that we don't care what people think about us or what people say about us. We don't care how people judge us. We don't care how people marginalize us. Don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying it doesn't hurt. I'm just saying, don't let it stop you in its tracks because people, will work to belittle us. The enemy will work through people to make us feel like we don't matter and we're invisible. You all, in the day and the time that we live, it is never more important than for us to live biblical truth. Truth changes everything. And if you hear the truth today, and if you he heed the truth of the words of Jesus Christ, and you make it your life's ambition to serve him, to love him, to obey him, to share Christ with others, everything else in your life will fall into place. I'm not saying you won't have problems. I'm saying that you will be living in the center of his perfect will and that his goodness and that his favor and that his grace will surround you as a shield. So look at your life today and listen to what truth is saying to you. When you read the Bible, remember it is a mirror and it shows us what we really look like, not what we think we look like. So today's truth is truth changes everything. I'm out of time, but goodbye and God bless you. Don't miss another episode of Bridges. Subscribe to our YouTube channel today where you can find all of Monica's latest teachings and interviews. It's easy to do. Just visit youtube.com, search Monica Schmelter and click subscribe. Once you are subscribed, click the bell icon to get notified when a new episode is available to view. Thanks for watching Bridges. Don't give in. God's word says you're an overcomer. It takes training, it takes discipline. And so when you're fighting that good fight of the faith, you take your story, whatever it is, and you saturate it in faith and you fight for it. Visit MonicaSchmelter.com to schedule Monica to speak at your next event.